This Zero Now program is brought to you with the support of our founding partners. I can't be protected by hopes and prayers. I won't use hope towards what's next. I'll make my own way. I know impossible is an opinion. I won't wait for safer schools. I want to create them. I don't want to be afraid anymore. I refuse to be a victim. I'm just one person. Determined. To bring us back to zero. I'm just one person. Determined. To bring us back to zero. I am just one person. Determined to bring us back to zero. Thank you so much for taking the time to interview with us today, Dr. Geller. My pleasure, Michael, my pleasure. So let's start with how you got into psychology and how you have found an intersection between that and campus safety. <laughs> well, that's a big question. You know, I've been a professor here at Virginia Tech for 53 years. I'm into my 54th year. So I've been here a long time. And I started as a cognitive psychologist and, in fact, got tenure because of cognitive research in cognitive psychology. But over the years, I realized this is not making a difference. I mean, yes, it's nice to study theory and to look into cognitive theories, but I wanted to make a difference. You know, in fact, the, the subtitle of my autobiography is called Driven to Make a Difference. So it turned out that behavioral science is difference making. I mean, if we can improve behavior on a large scale, we're going to make a difference. And it's, we don't need a cl clinician to do that. We can teach people how to observe behavior, how to intervene to improve behavior, and thus make a difference. So that, that's what happened. And then, of course, I got into humanistic psychology, which, of course, we need more humanism in this world. The big word in humanism is empathy. We need to see the situation from the other person's perspective. So anyway, I'm calling it now humanistic behaviorism. The academic approach to what we talk is humanistic behaviorism. And then we, mm -hmm. I can go on and on. One quick point. We had a tragedy in 2007, April 16th. As many people know, of course, in those days, shooting were, shootings were rare. Now it's commonplace. Oh, I'm um, another shooting. But back when we had that, it was, it was quite, a, quite an event. And the bottom line is, many people showed caring. I got hundreds of communications about, are you okay? Uh, and so forth. So we decided we have to do this before the tragedy. We have to be proactive. So what we came up with was the actively caring for people movement. And maybe I'm getting too ahead of myself, but let me just briefly explain. Absolutely. We wanted, we wanted to develop a process where people can learn about other positive events in people's lives. And so we came up with, I'm wearing a wristband right here. It's a green wristband, and it says, actively caring for people. And the process is identified or realized as STEP, S-T-E-P. S, see an act of kindness. T, thank them. And in this case, thank them with a wristband. Give them this wristband and say, thank you for what you've just done for another person. Please accept this wristband to join our movement. It's a movement to, to promote actively caring behavior worldwide. And on mm -hmm. the wristband is a number, an identification number. And so what we want the person to do when I give him this wristband, please go to the website, ac4p, ac, the number 4p.org, and report this positive exchange we just had. And then, of course, mm -hmm. don't, hold, don't keep this wristband, but pass it on to another person. That's the P of step. So see an act of kindness, thank them, tell them to enter this event isn't it time we started spreading positive gossip for a change, you know, and then pass it on. So if you go to that website, AC, the number 4P.org, you will see thousands of positive stories that people have shared 
with regard to actively caring. One more point. I have a blue wristband, and police officers in three states, we've started a process actively caring for people policing. The idea here is a police officer sees an act of kindness and thanks them for that with, with a blue wristband. And the whole process is the same, except blue for police. And, and by the way, we found that when a citizen gets a blue wristband from a, from a police officer, they don't want to pass it on, man. This is a very special token of appreciation. I'm holding, my, I'm holding on to my blue wristband. Anyway, that's how, the, that's how the process goes. And our challenge now is to get people using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much there, Dr. Geller. Thank you so much. And I think one of the interesting things that you touch on here is how acts of kindness are underrated, not only by the giver, but also by the receiver. And what I mean by that is people tend to underestimate how much their act of kindness will affect somebody else. And so they don't do it because they don't think that that nice word or that compliment is going to make a difference. So they say, forget it. A lot of new research just came out about that. Um, so I think that the movement that you have here really helps foster this spirit of doing nice things and seeing how that can create a ripple effect within society. And you know what also was underrated, Michael? Gratitude. Showing gratitude. I mean, we do research on our campus just observing how many pedestrians crossing the road in a marked sidewalk wave and thank the driver for stopping for them. Less than 10 percent. Less wow. than 10. And we're talking about thousands of observations over over two, three years. My point is we've, we've, we've become a society of self-serving. You know, I think I think the Internet, I think social media has driven us to stay within ourselves has taken away the social exchange, the, the social interaction between people. In a sense, it's created a bunch of introverts. And, and I am an introvert in terms of my personality, but man, it's good to get out and interact personally with people. In fact, in the, in the edu education world, we're moving toward virtual instruction instead of in-person instruction. So again, we're moving away from the one critical thing that we need to help people improve their lives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's social, social, um, what am I looking, looking for? It's, it's social connections. It's connections with people. Well, one of the reasons for that is, you know, you, you talk about um, emphasizing humanistic psychology, which is often contrasted to behaviorism in psychology, which is this idea that when somebody does something good, we give a positive reinforcement. When somebody does something bad, we give a negative reinforcement. But the thing with acts of kindness is you don't always immediately see how that small act influence somebody. A lot of the gratitude that people feel is internal. We don't realize how big of an effect it has. So I think that your approach of taking a humanistic approach, which means looking at the entire person and understanding their intentions and their motivations, can really help understand the complexity of people's psychology. So can you tell us a little bit about how your more humanistic approach compared to a behaviorist approach has impacted your work and your movements? interesting question very thoughtful first when we reward see the best way to eliminate an, an undesirable behavior is to reward a desirable behavior reward a behavior that's incompatible with the undesirable behavior and of course that's acts of kindness but not only do we reward it we show gratitude again I'm back to gratitude and what does gratitude do it works both ways will you give gratitude sincere gratitude you feel better. And of course, the person to whom you're giving gratitude, they feel better. That person feels better. So bottom line, it, humanistic psychology also connects to this word called empathy. Empathy meaning, how about seeing the situation from the other person's perspective? Again, we're this self-serving, me first generation. And by the way, let's, I don't want to get into politics, but let's talk about politics, talking about it's, it's I, I did this, I do this. I, it's not, it's we, we're in this together. And so I think we have a society that doesn't realize interdependency. Inter, it should be the declaration. 
we're in this together. And that's the point we have, I think we have to, have to connect to. And so how can we develop an interdependent society, an interdependent culture? And of course, that key word again is empathy. First, we have to see it from the other person's perspective. You know, when we're asking questions or when we're, when we're giving feedback. By the way, that's another critical point. Practice does not make perfect. Only with feedback can we improve. But how do you give feedback? How do you tell a person that they made a mistake? It's supportive feedback, by the way. We don't give enough supportive feedback. We don't tell people how much we do appreciate what they've done well. But let's talk about corrective feedback. How do you tell them they're wrong? That's wrong, that, there's nothing there. In fact, that turns people off. How do you correct a behavior? How do you make it better? I, the word is empathy. Ask more questions. Before telling them that's wrong, ask them. Is, is that the best way to do it? Is there a safer way to do that behavior? Tell, and then they might, actually say, yes, you're right. I should have done this now. Now you've made a difference because they owned up to the mistake that they made. But we, we don't take the time to even teach people that simple way of giving corrective feedback. And mm -hmm. one more point, as I, it's redundant, I said, we don't pay enough attention to the good things that people do. And I'm, we're talking about schools now. In schools, to what extent do we pay attention to the good things that students are doing. Now, interesting point, it reminds me, every time I pass this elementary school on my way to work, they have a big sign that says, gives the name of a student and says, fourth grader so-and-so is the student of the month. And of course, they think they're doing something great. They think they're promoting this one student. I claim that that's not so great because there's one winner and 600 losers. And how do those students feel about this one person that got this student of the month? Do they think it's fair? Is it, does it create a competition? You know, again, it, it gets us away from what, what I said earlier, interdependent. We're in this together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that what you've gotten at is that we have really created a culture of independence and what we can do for ourselves. And in that we have lost this instinctive altruism that people have for other people. Um, and there was a really interesting study about this that I wanted to share. I'm sure that um, you've encountered it, but it was the study with a, a cup of hot chocolate and um, participants in the study were asked to either keep the hot chocolate or give the hot chocolate away. And if they chose to give it away, they had to rate how happy they think it would make the other person on the scale from negative five to five. And the average answer was like a one or a two. They think it would make them a little bit happy. But in reality, the participants who received the hot chocolate rated it like a three and a half or a four, like super high. So what that shows is that people underestimate just how happy kind deeds will make other people. And, and I think that everything that you've gotten to here really promotes this idea that if we create a society of interdependence, if we're nice to one another, that can make tremendous strides in creating a society in which people care for each other and do good things for one another. So I think that's all great, but what I'm curious about from your perspective is how does this impact schools specifically? How can we use this idea to make our schools a safer and more altruistic environment? Let me just say one thing to follow up to your, your hot chocolate study. We are doing research right now where we are studying the impact on mood when giving a thank you card to your professor. So after class, a student is assigned to, to give, and we, we've customized a thank you card. It's a, it's a card, it's a, it's a nice, and we give it to the professor. I must tell you, a lot of students are reluctant to do that. They feel awkward, they feel strange giving a professor a thank you, but we also do, before, in the beginning of class, they fill out a mood survey that, that, that assess how, what's their mood, happy, sad, and so forth. And then after they give the thank you card to the professor, we reassess, they reassess their mood. And sure enough, just like the hot chocolate, that student who gave the thank you card, they feel 
much better after showing gratitude, after giving the thank you card. So again, giving gratitude increases a sense of happiness. We mm -hmm. call it subjective well-being. Your subjective well-being increases when you show gratitude and when you receive gratitude. Now let's get back to the schools. We ran a program in schools that ended up being published and it really reduced bullying behavior in schools. What did we do? The teacher asked the class to simply fill out a, a little three by five card for any act of kindness that they saw in the classroom. Either they saw it or they received it. And they filled out this card and they put it in this treasure chest. That's what they called it. And then in the beginning of every class day, the teacher pulled out randomly, actually three cards, and she read them to the class. And then she randomly selected one of those students to be the actively caring student of the day and gave them a wristband. And we have these in child sizes. But that's not, that's not student of the month. That's just one day that they get to wear the wristband. But here's what the point. The teacher paid attention to acts of kindness. And as, as the project went on, more and more students reported positive acts of kindness in their classroom. And we've done this in several schools. It's a very simple procedure, and you see how it connects directly to the actively caring for people movement. Yeah, and what's so great about the movement is that it it's demonstrating these things in real time. Um, because like we've talked about, it's hard to create an environment in which people feel comfortable to do these things because they feel awkward and they don't think it's going to matter. So my question, Dr. Geller, is for people who don't have this background in psychology, who haven't seen the relevant research, how can we motivate them to tap into their altruism, to want to do nice things for people? Wow. Again, great question. Now, I want to say I do have a TEDx talk. I have a TED talk. It's 15 minutes. It's on self-motivation. So part of it is getting yourself self-motivated. In fact, in that TED talk, I teach about feeling empowered. What does it take to feel empowered? And there's, there's three questions you ask. First question, can I do it? Can I show gratitude? Can I sh do an act of kindness? Now, with, in that regard, like giving a thank you card to a professor, we found that we have to do some role play. Because the, student, the students feel a little bit awkward doing this, they have to do some role play and tell you something else. They have to believe that other people are doing it. I don't want to be the only one. In psychology, we call about a, a descriptive norm. When people believe that other people are doing something, they're more likely to do it themselves. And I sometimes wonder if it's this undesirable behavior, even the school shooting that are happening, I wonder if that's become a descriptive norm. Everybody's doing it. Copycat stuff. Anyway, that's the first question. Can I do it? The second, and we call that, by the way, self-efficacy. Do I believe I can do this simple act of kindness? And the second question is response efficacy, meaning, do I believe that this behavior is worthwhile? That this behavior will help us make a difference? And again, sometimes it takes some data, some research to say, yes, if people started showing more acts of kindness, even showing more gratitude, we're going to improve subjective well-being. We're going to improve human welfare. That's the second question. And that, I just referred to an education question, you know? Sometimes we have to teach you, and like I say, there's well, there's a lot. You can just Google it. You can Google um, these concepts and, you know, um, chat GBT. They have answers for you, man. And then third question, however, is a motivational question. Will it work? Will it? No, no, no. I'm sorry. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? Doing all this, risk, whatever it is, is it worth it? Now that's motivation. We know that people are motivated by consequences. And in many cases, it's not worth it, man. I, and besides, it's only me. It's only me doing it. It's not going to make a difference in our world, in our society, in our, in our school. If I'm the only one doing it, now we get back to descriptive norm. 
we get everybody doing it. We get everybody involved in recognizing acts of kindness and then doing acts of kindness to get that recognition. Yeah, you know, what really struck out to me is this idea of descriptive norms can be used to motivate positive behavior and negative behavior or explain positive behavior and negative behavior. And it reminds me of the uh, sociologist Martin Granovetter and his theory of how a riot spreads um, and how, you know, there's the first person starts and they have a threshold of zero. And then the second person does it and they see that that first person did it and that person has a threshold of one. And then the next person has a threshold of two and so on and so on and so on until a totally normal person with the threshold of 500 or 600 or 1,000 is also participating in that behavior. And he uses that model of a threshold to explain riots, which we have a negative connotation with. But I think what you're saying is that a similar idea can be applied to positive behavior, that if people see other people engaging in an act, they themselves will feel motivated to do it too. Absolutely. And another term that relates to all of this is observational learning. How much do we learn by watching others? You know, and sometimes we don't realize people, people are watching, we're watching each other. It's, and, and we are learning from each other. And my question is, what are we teaching those people? Are we teaching them to be positive? Or are we teaching them to be negative? Mm -hmm. Another point related to all of this, how do we try to influence behavior? Do we use positive consequences to reward desirable behavior? Or do we use negative consequences in school to stifle undesirable behavior? And which happens more often? And I'll say it again, the best way to eliminate an undesirable behavior is to reward, pay attention to behavior that's incompatible with the undesirable behavior. Then you know what you get? A positive attitude. See, mm -hmm. if you use positive consequences, you're gonna get a positive attitude with regard to that whole situation. Negative consequences, the reverse. That's so interesting because that's not usually how we think of, of it. We usually just kind of let positive behavior go unspoken about and unrewarded. And if somebody does something bad, they get thrown in detention or they get a call home or whatever the case may be. So I think that adopting that model could be really helpful in boosting morale in our schools. And, you know, when we talk about school violence, which is the mission of Zero Now, making schools safer, reducing school violence, um, a lot of the conversation is about what can we, how can we prevent this from happening? And there's so much technology around and, and systems to detect guns and all of this stuff, which is great. But what we don't talk about is how can we infiltrate the culture? How can we infuse positivity in the culture to stop this from happening in the first place? So we don't even need the technology. And I think that's what we're getting at here. And it reminds me of what you said in the beginning of the interview, which I would love to hear more about, which is being proactive instead of reactive when it comes to influencing behavior. And boy, that's a magic word. That's a, I mean, again, we do react and we do show caring. But we're talking about actively caring before the tragedy. Now, by the way, that's not easy because we're, we're very busy doing our thing, getting immediate consequences, motivating our ongoing behavior. But it takes, here's another word for you, emotional intelligence, EQ. Not IQ, man, it's emotional intelligence. Having the emotional intelligence, which means having the perspective to realize that I have to do something now to prevent other stuff from happening in the future. And that means I have to be proactive. And guess what? When I am proactive, I don't necessarily see a positive consequence to my proactive behavior, unless we have other people recognizing that. I'm back to that word social support. I'm back to the notion that supporting each other with regard to their proactive, actively caring for people behavior. Simple as that. We do it realizing that if we don't, we're gonna get more of these tragedies. And we, we know, we have, to, we have to start talking about how we're gonna prevent this. Because it's becoming just too, too normal. It's becoming a descriptive norm, as we said, you know. We, we gotta prevent it. So we have to make a descriptive norm proactive. 
proactive acts of kindness, demonstrating the example for others. And what we do is we show gratitude, we, we, we show acts of kindness, we do the kinds of things that build a descriptive norm of interdependency. We're in this together. So, Dr. Keller, what do you say to the skeptics out there, to the people who might say, you know what, I don't think acts of kindness is enough to stop school shootings, to reduce bullying, to reduce sexual violence. I think that we need to have harsh penalties for these behaviors. That is what is going to stop people from doing them. What do you say to people who might not see it this way? What's something that you might use to convince them otherwise? Oh, that's a, well, the first thing I can say is the technique we've been using has, is not working. I mean, penalizing, putting people in prison, that all the negative consequences. I mean, it does a, it's a temporary fix for the person that did it. We, we separate them from society. We make the situation safer. But long term, open our eyes, folks. It ain't working, man. And now we have a culture of self-serving. Where's the trust anymore? That's another issue we could, we could spend time talking about, why we essentially lack trust. Everybody is trying to, seems to be trying to scam somebody else, you know? How many email messages do you get or phone calls do you get? I get too many that somebody's trying to pull it over on me, you know, probably because of my age. But my point oh, yeah. is we have to turn it around. We have to say, let's be positive. Let's look for desirable behavior and let's, by the way, the desirable behavior doesn't stick, stick at it. The negative behavior sticks out. We notice that. We have to start noticing the positive things. We have to start noticing, because guess what? If you see something, say something. Now that term simply means if you see something negative. But what if we say, if you see something positive, say something. So see something, say something can go for both the undesirable behavior and desirable behavior. And more, if more of us paid attention in the schools, paid attention to desirable behavior, guess what? Those teachers are setting the example. And we, we here's another word, vicarious reinforcement. Vicarious reinforcement simply means when we see somebody else getting rewarded for desirable behavior, we're more likely to do that behavior because it's indirect. We see them doing it, so we're more likely to do it. How about if we just develop a culture where we just pay attention to desirable behavior and we show gratitude when we see that behavior? And another word related is supportive feedback. We give support. We identify that behavior that we saw that person do, and we thank them. We thank them for that behavior. Again, rather than putting the name of one student on a big sign saying student of the month, how about every day identifying the various behaviors of the many students in the classroom that are showing desirable behavior and then thank them. Don't have to make a big deal. Thank them. Other people are watching and those teachers, they're the exemplar. They're setting the example for others. And if we put more attention on desirable behavior and more attention on showing gratitude for desirable behavior, we're going to change our culture. We're starting mm -hmm. with the school and that can spread. The kids will take it back to their home, talk to their parents, and maybe we can make a difference. I'm just thinking about how amazing this would have been when I was in high school, because we have detention, we have suspension, we have all of these ways to combat negative behavior, but we don't have anything to facilitate positive behavior. So there are so many things that we've spoken about here, um, ways that a school can change a culture by rewarding positive behavior, rewarding interconnectivity. And I think that is an amazing place to start for reducing harm and reducing violence. And people might not think there's a correlation, but everything that we've talked about here today, the studies that we've gone back and forth with seem to suggest otherwise. So I think that this is a really great framework for educators and administrators to, to consider and to adopt. And you know what's important? As you just said it so well, Michael, it's common sense, right? It comes across as common sense, but I can tell you right now, it's also science. I mean, we had years of research demonstrating everything we said here today. So, wow, isn't that nice? We have 
empirical evidence for the common sense that you just expressed. Now we just have to do it. We just have to, we have to just do it. And it's, it's not complicated, is it? It's, it's, and by the way, what if we had some way of making a list? Teachers make a list. Principals make a list of the desirable behavior that they seen out there. Maybe it's see something. Maybe we didn't have a chance to say something. But what have you seen on our campus that is really worthwhile, really positive? And then you have a, a group meeting someday. You have the auditorium and the teacher gets up and says, these are some of the positive things I've seen in our culture. And I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to recognize that, but let me recognize all of you. And I, I don't need to ne mention any names. I'm just going to make a list here of all the kind acts of kindness that I've seen on our campus. It's about mm -hmm. paying attention to that kind of stuff one more time, making acts of kindness a descriptive norm. It's also, by the way, in that case, an injunctive norm. Injunctive means it's socially desirable. So our challenge, our mission is to make desirable behavior, descriptive norms, in this case, acts of kindness, which are like, which are obviously also injunctive. Dr. Geller, I think that is amazing. I think that you've provided a really unique perspective. Um, I'm so glad that you were able to illuminate psychological principles for us and how those can be used to create positive environments and in doing so, reducing harm in our schools, which of course is what we're trying to do here at Zero Now. So thank you so much for this conversation. It was exciting, it was illuminating, and I think it has the power to really make a difference. So just really wanted to thank you for taking the time today. Michael, thank you. Can I say one more thing? There is of course. A, there's a website, Geller, my name, Geller, ac4p.com or .org. If you go to that website, I've, I've authored several books that are available about this whole mission of actively caring for people. We have one for schools. We have one for police officers. We have one for parents. So check it out. And there you can see a review of each of these books. So my point is there are resources available to teach people the reason, the rationale, the science behind what we've talked about here today. And I thank you, Michael, for Listen, the ivory tower doesn't work unless we get it out to the real people. And you guys are helping yep. to make that happen. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, doctor.